We're, um, we're going to be talking about a simple example of, of systems analysis. I put the term up here. Um, everything, almost everything we deal with in, in uh, science, engineering, even everyday life has some elements of, uh, of system analysis to, to it. <coughs> the simplest kind of a system, kind of like the one I have here, consists of a reservoir where you store things and inputs and outputs. With that definition, I think you can imagine a wide variety of things that might resemble this. For example, the heat budget of the Earth, which we'll be speaking about uh, next week. You can store heat in the Earth's uh, solid parts in the atmosphere. You can have heat coming from the sun, which is the input. You can have heat radiating to space. And it's the nature of that uh, systems um, analysis that will help to understand the climate of the Earth. If you look at the hydrologic cycle, for example, let's look at the atmospheric part. How much water vapor do you have stored in the atmosphere? What are the inputs? What are the outputs? Only by understanding that way can we really understand how water vapor is handled in the Earth's uh, atmosphere. Same thing for lakes. A lake has a storage capability. It has inputs. It has outputs. Uh, the carbon cycle. There's carbon in the atmosphere stored there. Inputs and outputs. In other words, almost everything we deal with in life has some elements of, of a simple system like the one we're dealing with today. So this is meant to be nothing special about it. It's just a, um, an analog for many of the things that we'll be dealing with in this course and you may run into in other circumstances as well. So um, we have to first understand those three components, right? The storage, the reservoir itself, the input, and the output. So this is a thin tank made of um, plexiglass. And the dimensions you will need, the dimensions are here. The inside dimensions of that are 59 centimeters in length, 2 centimeters in width, and uh, 25 centimeters in depth. So if you need to compute the volume of this, you can do it easily from those, from those dimensions. Um, it has a little pipe, a little hole in the end, at this end, you can't see it from where you're sitting, a short little pipe, a valve, and then it flows out into the sink and down into the drain. We'll need to know that that um, valve is about six centimeters below the bottom of the tank. I'll explain why that's important in just a moment. Um, the input is this little rubber hose right here. It's controlled by a faucet. And I can change the rate at which water is flowing in just by twisting that, um, twisting that valve. And then the, um, the output comes out the valve. And that's a valve, that's a controllable valve. But I'm going to leave it set where it is for right now. And we're going to just leave it and, and deal with it in the, form that it's, in the form that it's in. Any questions yet about this simple system I have here? OK, now, the inputs and the outputs, we're going to use uh, capital Q for this. It's the volume flow rate. And it'll have units of milliliters per second. Or if you like, a milliliter is a cubic centimeter. It's a centimeter by a centimeter by a centimeter. And uh, the way we're going to measure that, and, and Patrick has agreed to help me with this, if you can um, line up. Try that stopwatch. Try starting it, stopping it, and then resetting it over here. OK, is that going to work? So um, I'm going to pull out this pipe. This is a 400 milliliter container. Four hundred milliliter container. So we're going to time how long it takes to fill that up. And then um, we will just get the, get the flow rate from that. So um, 
I will give you a countdown. Three, two, one, start. And as soon as that reaches the top there, you can stop it. Okay. So the flow rate coming out of the valve right now is um, Q is 400 milliliters divided by 7.41. Can you do that calculation there for me? 400 by 7.41. 53.98. And the units on that are going to be milliliters per second. So we're going to be doing this over and over again with different flow configurations. Um, now, what I've got to, you can sit for a few minutes. It'll take a while now to get this set. I'm going to try to um, determine the nature of the valve. How, how easily is the valve letting water out of the tank? That's going to be a criti critical part of our understanding of this system. And um, I'm going to tell you that Q out will take the form of some constant times the square root of Z effective, where Z is the depth of the water. I think you would uh, expect that the deeper the water, the more pressure there is trying to push water through the valve. And so the faster Q out will be, the larger Q out will be. So we have to determine the, um, well, this constant. This constant will depend on how I have that exit valve set. And if I were to change it, I'd have to redo uh, the calculation of K again. But I'm going to leave it like it is. We're going to let this come to a steady state for a minute. And then we'll do a calculation. Now, what is the effective? If the uh, water depth is here, we measure Z as the height from the bottom of the tank up to the water top. And then we add six centimeters to it. So Z effective is Z plus six centimeters. Because that gives us the depth all the way to the valve itself. And that's what's going to be pushing the water out. The, the point is, even when the uh, tank is empty, if there's a little bit of water in that pipe, that vertical pipe, you're still going to be getting some water running out until all the water in the pipe is gone. And then, of course, Z effective would be zero. And then, of course, Q out would be zero. So we're going to determine this. How are we going to do it? We're going to simply solve this for K. So it's going to be Q out divided by the square root of Z effective. Um, so let's do, uh, Patrick, let's do this calculation again now. Let's do the uh, Q out first. Are you ready? You set? Yeah. One, two, three, start. So what is Q out? Do the do that or something? Uh, 47 .79. Could you now measure the depth of this, please? In centimeters, come around and measure it from the top of the plastic there, not from the table, but from the top of the plastic and get the depth. Ten centimeters, okay. So that means the effective is going to be sixteen. So if you could do one more calculation for me then. I need to get um, forty-seven point seven nine divided by the square root of sixteen. Well that's easy, isn't it? Square root of sixteen is four. So it's um, eleven point nine five. Okay. Eleven point nine five. Okay. So the valve constant K is a, thanks, we're done for a while. So the valve constant K for that particular valve setting is um, 11.95. The units on that are weird. You'd have to work out the units from the flow rate here and the fact that the Z is inside a square root sign. But we'll just leave it as a, 
a, a, a number for, without the, the units on it. So we've characterized the inflow controlled by my faucet. We've characterized the reservoir characterized by its dimensions. And we've characterized the outflow by finding this valve constant K. So now we know for any fluid depth, we can compute what the, what the, outflow, um, what the outflow will be. So we're off to a good start. Now, um, we have to do a little bit of calculation to um, protect against um, disaster here. So um, let's try to compute from these, from these formulas what flow rate, what's the maximum flow rate I could use before the tank would overflow, OK? So uh, let's see. We're going to use, uh, we're going to assume a steady state. In which case, Q in will equal Q out. And um, so I'm going to solve, I'm going to specify some particular Q in. And then the Q out is going to be given by this valve constant times the square root of Z effective. Now, what's the maximum value Z effective could be? It's the depth of the tank, 25 centimeters plus the six centimeters to get down to the valve. So this is going to be k times the square root of 31, if I've done that calculation correctly. And could you do that for me, Patrick? What's that? Use the uh, valve constant here. And uh, then times the square root of 31. Sixty-six point five three. Okay. So we're going to have to watch out for that number. We're not going to want to put more water in there than uh, that value. That's in, in milliliters per second. We predict a faster flow rate than that would make the whole system overflow. So now let's see if we can predict a um, the level that the water will come to when I change the input flow rate. So let's, uh, I'll take this out of here. I'm going to, um, let's see, I'll decrease it a little bit. We'll do a measurement, Patrick, on the new flow rate here. You ready? One, two, three, start. What's the time on that? What's it again? 10.75. 10.75. What's that flow rate? Thirty-seven point two one. Thirty-seven point two one. Okay. So here's a proposal. If I stick that flow back in the tank, what water depth will we get when it reaches a steady state? Let's do the calculation first. Uh, well, no, I guess we can plug it in there and get it running. It'll take a while for, uh, for this to, to work out. So let's do the calculation. We're going to now solve for Z effective. So again, using the steady state assumption, I'm going to say um, Z effective will be um, Q in over K squared. Is that right? Yeah, I've just taken this and solved for Z effective. So that's going to be um, 37.21 over 11.95. And we will square that and see what we get for a prediction for the water depth. Can you do that for me? Nine 
9.70 centimeters. Right. Well, now that doesn't look like it's going to work out too well, does it? Let's do a quick measurement here. I'll do it. Has that reached a steady state? Right now we've got three centimeters in there. So our prediction looks pretty poor at this stage. Oh wait, that was Z effective. Ah, so Z we would predict would be six centimeters less than that, so that would be 3.7. My Z measured was three. That's a pretty good prediction, actually. I forgot about that, that offset. Now let's do it one more time just to be sure this system works. I'm going to crank up the flow rate a little bit. We're going to repeat the experiment. One, two, three. 6.06. What's that for a flow rate? Uh, 66.0. 66.0. I remind you of our warning. Well, let's give it a try, shall we? It looks like that's right on the margin of what's going to happen. So we will take a look and see what happens with this 66. Um, the units again on this are milliliters per second. While we're doing this, we might uh, talk about a few other elements of the problem. Um, let's see. Would anything up here changed, change if I made this tank wider? What if this tank, instead of being two centimeters wide, were 10 or 20 or 30 centimeters wide would, um, let's see, would this calculation for the maximum um, possible flow rate change? It's a, it's a wider tank, reservoir is much larger, can hold a lot more water. It, would that still be the maximum flow rate this system could handle or would it change? Any thoughts on that? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, nothing would change. Uh, now, um, however, it would take a lot longer to reach the equilibrium state. You'd have to, to get the water up to a new depth or to dra drain it down to a new depth. It would take, instead of just a few minutes, it could take maybe 20 or 30 minutes if that tank were wider. But in terms of the equilibrium states for this particular system, it is independent of this depth. Remember, the pressure that is pushing water out the bottom depends on the depth only. It doesn't depend on how wide the tank is. That's the key. This formula here does not need to take into account the horizontal dimensions of the of the, of the box. So um, the equilibrium states would be, un now that's, that's a very interesting result and something that would be uh, interesting to understand in all the other contexts that we'll approach in this course, like the, the water budget, the heat budget, the CO2 budget. What is the role of the size of the reservoir on the equilibrium states or, and or the rate at which you approach the equilibrium states. In this case, the width does not influence the equilibrium states, but it does influence the rate at which you approach an equilibrium state. Okay, now, it looks like we've almost reached an equilibrium there. And I wonder, it doesn't look like we're in danger of overflowing. So let's do a quick test to see if maybe the flow rate changed. Now remember, there are errors in this calculation. Everything we're doing, for example, 
there's a, a potential error in this, uh, in this uh, valve constant K. If that's off by a few percent, we just did one test. We didn't do a lot of tests and find the best value. We just did one quick test. So when I see something that doesn't quite make sense like this, I'm wondering, well, maybe there's an error in the valve constant, but maybe also there's been some change in the rate at which we're putting water in. So Patrick, let's just check that flow rate. In fact, let's do it off the exit. We'll do it off the exit. And uh, one, two, three. And what's that? 63.10. Okay. So that's a little bit less than we thought. Maybe uh, the system's not quite in steady state. Maybe it's still filling. Or maybe the line pressure in the building has changed slightly and there's a little bit less water coming into the system. But it is pretty high. It may still be rising slowly. And so I think we're not too far off in our estimate that a 66 milliliter per second thing would bring it pretty much to the top of the um, top of the tank. So I think um, I think I'd call that a success, even though we haven't quite proven that it's could come right up to the to the very top. I'm going to talk about a few other aspects of this. Are there? But before I do that, I want to see if you have questions on how this system works. We've looked at it from several points of view. There must be something, some part of it, you didn't fully grasp when I went through it. So. So let's have some questions about what's really going on here. Anything? OK, well, yeah, question. Um, Sir. What, what exactly is K again? OK, the question is, what is K? I'm calling it the valve constant. It's the, um, I've got an exit valve here. Let me lift it up and show it to you. I can do this. See that valve there? Uh-oh. Sprung a leak. Sorry about that. I got you down there, didn't I? It's always dangerous to sit in front like that. Um, so th there's a valve there that I could adjust by hand. And um, if I changed, if I close that valve down, K would be smaller. If I opened it up more, K would be larger. It has to do with the, the area of the pipe that's closed off by the valve. I can derive this formula, by the way, from um, Bernoulli's law. You may have heard of Bernoulli's law. It relates pressure and velocity in, in moving fluids. And here, I can compute the pressure by knowing the depth of the water, and then knowing something about the velocity and the area of the valve. I can compute the flow rate. So this formula can be derived, but without knowing the area, without going in there with a microscope and measuring how much area is open in that valve, I have to treat K as a, an empirical constant. I have to determine it experimentally, which is what we did. Right? Other questions? Um, so let's see. Formula's on the board there. Let's try to think about what some of the analogies might be with this system then. Um, the most obvious one is with a lake. If you have uh, rainfall coming into rivers that's providing uh, a certain amount of input, uh, where the lake exits into a river, there's probably some kind of a, of a control. Maybe it's a low dam, maybe it's just rocks in the stream, but the outflow is going to be controlled by the depth of the water, typically, in a lake. Therefore, it'll reach an equilibrium state very much the way this one does. The exit law will be a little bit different. It won't be this formula exactly, but there'll be some relationship between the depth of the water and the rate at which water leaves. Then um, equilibrium will be very much analogous to what we have here. What about the transients? Well, if you get a drought, uh, that would be equivalent to closing this valve down a little bit. And the water will continue to exit from the lake, but the lake level will drop. There's still water going in, but it's not enough to support the rate at which the water is flowing out. You might reach a new equilibrium, or depending how, how much I've closed that, 
This might actually bottom right, or come right down to the bottom. We'll watch and see what happens with that. What's another analogy? How about um, water vapor in the atmosphere? Now, it's not a liquid anymore. It's a vapor. The input would be um, uh, evaporation from lakes and from trees. Um, the output would be rain. Now, the rain, uh, which forms in clouds, falls to the earth. Probably the rain rate is going to be proportional, roughly, to how much water vapor you have. So the loss of water vapor from the atmosphere is going to work a little bit like this, too. You're going to have a constant input, which is going to be the evaporation. And then as the humidity in the atmosphere approaches 100% and you begin to form clouds with precipitation, that Q out is going to increase, and you're going to reach a steady state. And that's what we have most of the time in the Earth's atmosphere is a kind of a balance. Yeah, that one almost bottomed out kind of a balance between in inputs and outputs. Let's think about um, the heat budget of the Earth. So let, um, this is a, perhaps more difficult to imagine, but let the amount of water in that tank represent the amount of heat stored in the atmosphere and the ocean. Uh, it's getting heat from the sun. The Earth is losing heat by radiating it to space. Uh, the hotter, of course, the, the amount that, uh, of heat that the Earth is receiving is not particularly sensitive to its own temperature. That's just how hot is the sun, how far is the sun from the Earth, how much of the sun's radiation reflects off the Earth. Let's say that's a given. Um, then uh, the temperature of the Earth is going to determine, though, how much radiates to space. The hotter the Earth is, the faster it's going to will be the rate at which energy is lost to space. So again, it's kind of analogous to this. You're going to reach an equilibrium. The temperature of the Earth is going to rise until the rate of energy lost to space matches the rate of energy gained from the sun. Then you'll have an equilibrium temperature for the Earth. And if the sun were to increase its temperature, let's say that's the temperature of the Earth. If the sun were to increase its temperature, or for some other reason, we were adding more heat to the Earth system, suddenly we'd go into a transient stage. It wouldn't come to a new equilibrium right away. There would be a transient stage where the temperature builds up to a new value where, once again, an equilibrium can be sustained. And we'll see that here. Every time I change this input valve setting, we go through a transient stage and then approach to a new a new steady state. So that's the way climate works um, on the Earth as well. Questions on that one? Yes? So, um, when did you start the 50 percent of the time for the maximum and maximum Is there a way to do that for the minimum where it will bottom out? Yes, let's do that calculation. The question is whether we can compute the flow rate that would bring it to zero. Now, by zero, we mean empty the tank, but there'd still be some water in the little pipe down at the bottom, right? So Q to minimize, or to empty the tank, let's say, Q in to empty the tank would be K times the square root, times the square root of the minimum value of Z effective. When the tank is empty, Z is 0, so Z effective is 6. So I'll put 6 centimeters in there. And um, Patrick, could you do that calculation for me? It's the valve constant, 11.9 times the square root of 6. So uh, that's a good question. Now, whether that has any analog in these other systems I'm talking about, I'm not so sure. For example, what would it mean? Uh, well, of course, a lake could, could empty out. We can, we can imagine that. Could we imagine the Earth storing no heat? Not really. It'd have to be at absolute zero. C 
So I don't think that, mac that minimum could be carried over to find an analogy in the Earth's heat budget. Probably not the maximum either. I mean, there's no such thing as overflowing the Earth's heat budget. Right? What's, where, where's the heat going to go? It's going to have to escape again. So not everything here has an analog with every system that we're talking about. But the basic elements of how an equilibrium is reached, I think that's the one that carries over fairly dramatically. So let's imagine what the, um, what would determine for the Earth's heat budget, what would determine the, um, the rate of approach to a new equilibrium? I think in this case it would be probably the heat capacity of the Earth. How much heat can you store? And so we'd have to do a calculation taking into account the, uh, the thermal heat capacity of the oceans, the thermal heat capacity, uh, capacity of the land surface, and that would determine the rate at which you'd approach the new equilibrium. Those things would not enter into what the new equilibrium state would be, but those would enter into the rate at which you reach that new equilibrium. So these nuances, I call them nuances, they're actually of central importance. The difference between the nature of the steady state and the nature of the transient state is quite important in all of these systems. Yes? Yeah. The question is, is there any analog in the systems I mentioned to the out valve? And um, yeah, I think there would be one. And it's one that I should have thought about to mention. Let me, uh, if we're talking about the heat budget um, analog, The heat budget analog is the Earth receiving heat from the sun, storing some of it, and then radiating it to space. Um, if I add, if I have an atmosphere with a greenhouse gas, and I add more greenhouse gas, then for the same temperature, it's harder to get the radiation out. So that would be, so adding a greenhouse gas like CO2 is essentially like closing down this valve a little bit. So let me try that. We'll do a little greenhouse experiment here. We'll pretend that this is an analog to the surface heat budget of our planet. And I'm going to add more absorbing gas to the atmosphere so that as the planet tries to radiate, it can't get that radiation out because of the, um, of the greenhouse gas. So I'll close this valve down. And watch what happens there. I haven't changed the input. Notice I'm not changing the sun. I'm not changing what radiation is coming in. But I'm changing the, uh, the output. I'm changing the output law. So I've just changed K by closing that valve down a little bit. So we're out of equilibrium. We're in a transient stage. The climate is out of balance. And um, it looks like I may have made a tactical error here. It looks like I've closed that valve down too much. We're going to, of course, we have a new value for the maximum now because I've closed the valve. Looks like I'm going to exceed that. But anyway, that's the transient. I'm going to have to open this up a bit. I put too much greenhouse gas in the atmosphere there. OK, so it reached a new equilibrium. It took a while to do that, but we heated up the Earth now it could get rid of radiation at the same rate that it's coming in. And we've achieved a new balance. So maybe that's, I, I like, I, thanks for that question, because that, uh, that provides another way to think about the analogy between this and the, earth and the heat budget. Was there a question back here? Yes? No, that's right. That's the remarkable thing. So the gases we normally think of as greenhouse gases, like carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor, they actually don't do very much to the sun's radiation at all. Uh, those uh, molecules do not absorb those short wavelengths coming from the sun. But they do absorb the longer wavelengths that the Earth is radiating at. We'll talk about this in class 
next week. So, so this is a pretty good analogy to that because adding greenhouse gas doesn't change the input, but it does change the output law. It changes the relationship between heat you've stored and the rate at which you're getting rid of heat by, by radiating to space. So it's a pretty good analogy to, um, to um, the greenhouse effect. Yeah? Yes, this radiation leaving will be equal to this once again, but now the Earth will be hotter. Yeah. The Earth will have to be hotter to maintain that balance. That's exactly the point. Yes, you go back to a steady state again where Q in equals Q out, but in order to do, just like here, the new steady state, Q in equals Q out, but now the water depth is greater. There's more heat stored in the system for this analog, and that means the Earth is a hotter place hotter place to be. Other questions on this? Well, I think that is, um, yeah, so let me just do one sketch then to make this transient thing a little bit more clear before we quit today. I want you to, I want to get this in your notes. Thinking about this tank, if I plot it versus time, um, Q in, and I plotted beneath that the depth of the water in the tank versus time, let's say we'd established some uh, flow rate, and it was in steady state, and so the water depth was constant as well. Let's do a couple little experiments here. If I suddenly increased the inflow rate, what would happen to the water depth? Does it jump as well? Well, no, we did that experiment. Actually, it begins to rise immediately. There's a kink in the curve, but not a jump in the curve. So it rises like this, and then ultimately approaches a new steady state. And as we've talked about, the time it takes to come to a new steady state, the length of this transient period, in this case, would depend on the width of the tank. If, I, if the tank happened to be twice as wide, say four centimeters instead of two centimeters, this curve would look something like this. It would take about twice as long to get to the new steady state. Um, to make matters even complicated, more complicated, what if I slowly increased the QN? Well, then this would be uh, even slower. But that's because I've gone slow on changing the inputs. Uh, but eventually, sometime after the new steady state for QN was reached, eventually the new steady state for the system would be reached. So we're going to want to understand, for the, in the case of, of global warming later in the course, we're going to want to understand the rate at which um, we're changing the properties of the system, Q in or Q out, and the nature of the transient response. And I think that'll do it for the day. We'll finish a little bit early, and I'll see you on uh, Monday.